from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. everyone, and for those of you who don't know me, I am Francisco Macias, the President of the Library of Congress Hispanic Cultural Society. Thank you for joining me uh, this afternoon. I am pleased to introduce Dr. Fernando Valerio Olguin. Fernando is a professor of Spanish, particularly Latin America and the Caribbean, at Colorado State University, <clears throat> where I had the privilege of being his student. Fernando has a PhD from Tulane University. In 1985, he received a Fulbright Fellowship for Advanced Studies on Latin American Literature. Other fellowships include the British Academy for Activities on International Culture, the U.S. Department of Education International Development Studies, Undergraduate Enhancement Project, Culpepper Teaching with Technology, and Mellon Summer Seminar Teaching Language Instruction for the 21st Century. In 2007, he was invited to present a paper on immigration and culture at Oxford University. He has published extensively essays, short stories, flash fiction, we'll, which we'll be hearing today, uh, poetry, and scholarly articles. And without further ado, please join me in welcoming Fernando. Thank you for joining us. Thank uh, Francisco Macias and others involved in organizing this activity. It's truly an honor to be here with you in this uh, prestigious institution. I'll share my poetry and my thought with you. Uh, I will start with a poem I, I like a lot called Canto a la Vida, Ode to Life. Uh, I should say that I don't write in English, so I depend on uh, generous friends for <laughs> translation. <laughs> uh, uh, I would like to read first in Spanish, so you can have a taste of the sound of the language, and then the translation into English. Canto a la vida. He cantado tanto a la muerte, cimbreada en mi prosa, con fragancia de azucena y alardes de amante desdeñosa, necesaria. He cantado a la muerte en mis versos llenos de buitres y flores amargas, y ruidos sordos como de río desbordado, de catástrofes, bostezos y lagartos grises, que hoy solo quiero cantarle a la vida que tanto amo, aunque bien lo disimule. Quiero cantar la alegría del vino en la mesa, los amigos, una tarde cualquiera en verano, la mirada de Adela sonriendo desde el extremo de la mesa, qué ángel de amor y osadías. Un gato ronronea entre las piernas de los comensales. Quiero cantar la esperanza aún de la piedra cansada en el camino y cambiar las lágrimas por el presentimiento de una dicha inminente. Hoy solo deseo sentirme simplemente feliz y salir a comprar tinta verde y escribir en papel cebolla. Quedan desde hoy proscritos en la prosa y el verso, los finales tristes, el desconsuelo. Quedan proscritos también los días jueves, César Vallejo, su tristeza, como cocida detrás de los párpados. Quedan proscritos el recuerdo vano, las madrugadas del sábado, la soledad de mis 50 años. Hoy solo quiero, pura y simplemente, cantar a la vida y beberme el sol que se cuela entre las ramas de los árboles una tarde cualquiera de junio. O oh, to life, so often have I song of death threading through my prose with the scent of lilies and the earth of a disdainful yet necessary lover. So often have I sung of death in my poetry, 
filled with vultures and bitter flowers and muffled sounds as of a river overflowing with disasters, yawns, and gray lizards. So that today I wish only to sing of life that I love so much, however much I try to hide it. I wish to sing of the joy of a wine on the table, of friends, of some summer evenings, Amelia's gaze smiling at me from the other end of the table. What an impudent angel of love. A cat purrs as he moves among the legs of those at table. I wish to sing of hope, even that of the tired tongue on the path, and exchange tears for the pres presence of imminent joy. Today I wish only to feel simply happy and go out and buy green ink and write on onion paper. From this day on, in both prose and verse, sad endings and despair are forbidden. Forbidden also are Thursdays, Cesar Vallejo's sadness, among almost song in beneath his eyelids. Forbidden vain memories, Saturday mornings, the loneliness of my 50 years. Today I wish only, purely and simply, to sing to life and drink in the song which filters through the leaves of the trees on no particular evening in June. Then, according to my list, I make a list, made a list this morning, <laughs> a very brief one. So I, I don't write a very long poem, so sometimes a couple of pages, but you know, sometimes brief ones like the flash uh, short stories. Uh, this one is a homage to Guillaume Apollinaire, a poet, a French poet. And it's a homage because he has a poem in French that says something like, uh, uh, at home I have a reason reasonable woman, uh, a, a cat, passing by all my books, um, always friends, without whom I couldn't live. So I wrote an answer to this poem, and I said, I never was so fortunate as Guillaume Apollinaire. In my house I have a reasonable cat, a woman passing by all my books, and friends sometimes without whom I could live. <laughs> <laughs> I have lost a couple of friends after this point because uh, <laughs> <laughs> they felt that I was uh, I didn't appreciate them so much. You know? <laughs> I will continue with uh, a portrait. Uh, uh, my first poetry book was self-portrait about friends, uh, famous writers and artists. Uh, and the, the last one was. Uh, portraits only. So I wrote this uh, portrait to, of uh, Paul Trembath. Uh, Paul Trembath is an English professor at uh, Colorado State University. He agreed that I publish. <laughs> I asked permission first. <laughs> and th there was something in the hospital uh, in Fort Collins, where I live, one morning, a guy arrived beaten by a zebra. So the, the first question was, zebras in Fort Collins? What drug is this guy is doing? You know? uh, he's saying that, no, there are zebras in Fort Collins. Uh, a guy was uh, walking by uh, some uh, place, and there are, there are some zebras and llamas. And then I wrote uh, this poem, Portrait of Paul Trembath with Zebras in Fort Collins. Uh, he gave me a quote that says, the person whom you love is the life that separates you from death, written by a, a drunker in, at a bar. <laughs> <laughs> Paul, what an odd birthday gift, abandonment, solitude, and so forth, successfully death. Selena, half woman, half illusion, of refulgent, straighted bosoms and long tresses of night and silence, 
left you disrupted before called zebras in Fort Collins at dawn. In a confusing dance of stripes and amaryllis bites before a catastrophe of hours and clocks and blood drain semaphores. You who wanted blue and metaphysical navigating in an ethylic water to inhabit a house of light only found streets, I'm sorry, only found streets filled with shadows and with eyes ablaze and zebras. Why are zebras so hated by your abstractions and aporias? From whence stands their rancor for you, professor associated of pain? If after all, as an English poet would say, zebras are a mistake of God. Welcome to Lazarus Dreams Bar, Paul. Let us raise our glasses and toast for oblivion for this aporia of stripes and denigrated pubis and maroon kisses. After all, we are not Swiss. Paul, what an odd tree life is that he sets a food, the identical cadavers. For I too, at my 49, found myself one day blind from pain and imperiled before death. And now, uh, let's uh, read the flash story, flash fiction. And this one is Romino, uh, a cat, it's my memories. Unlike the fantastic animal of Edgar Caretz, I have a cat that eats my memories. Each afternoon, Romino, that is my cat's name, wait, waits patiently for me to nestle on my armchair to remember, and then he rushes up to me and devours my memories. I try to defend myself. I close my eyes and defend inch by inch the stubbles of my memories. But my cat plays with them. He pretends not to see them. He lets them escape and then he pounces off Deng, he torments Deng a, a bit until finally he swallows Deng with great delight. I hardly have any memories left. And this has some advantage. I no longer need to drink so much in order to forget. Thus, Romino has eaten my childhood mornings, devoured the oceanfront sunsets in Santo Domingo. I no longer pine for the woman who once said she loved me. I don't even remember her name. Perhaps Romino ate it in some corners of the house. Today, just as Romino, I am doomed to the present. <laughs> as you can see, I like cats a lot. <laughs> and wine. <laughs> this is another cat, Ojijolo. He enjoyed the throw pillows, the fluffy arm charms, the throws, the open books. He explored in his con constant solitude the recesses of the house, the empty rooms. His novel following visible traces, the plants in the pots. With his eyes of crystal, he auscultated the night and its mystery. The birds and the squirrels in the limbs drove him into frenzy. Purring, he sought the, ri the, the riddly caress of his nape to his nape upon the electric spine. He sought refuge in my bosom and in my stripe of pubis. Ojijolo has died. Today, I blame sadness, and as a sign of mourning, I have shaved off my eyebrows so that I can no longer gaze upon myself in a mirror with my face of yesterday. And let me see, oh, maybe this one, invitation from Mr. H. Tonight, Mr. H has invited himself over for dinner. 
he has arrived early from work. He has removed his tie and served himself a glass of wine while he reviews the ordinary mail. He lights a small cigar of perfume leaves. He puts on the Billy Holiday CD that has I'm a fool to want you. He takes the shrimp out of the refrigerator and boils it with bay leaf and a bit of salt. He begins preparing a mango and cilantro chutney. He peels the mango, cuts it into small cubes, and adds a pinch of solitude. Such a fool to hold you. He chops the cilantro very finely, some Roma tomatoes, and mix everything well with two ounces of sadness. He sprinkles the mango, cilantro, and tomato with a drizzle of olive oil and adds a bit of hopelessness. To seek a kiss, to share a kiss. He pours a sip of Malbec in the opal glass and Billy Holiday sings, time and time again, I said I'll leave you, I went away. As he cooks the chutney, avoiding all desperation, he cuts a bit of manchego cheese and he sets the bread with garlic and olive oil to toast. Once dinner is ready, he begins to eat slowly between the sips of a very wise wine. Upon finishing, he lies back on the sofa and remains suspended in the haze. Billy Holiday sings, I'm a fool to love you. Well, I can read and read. You let me know. Uh, we have uh, we need some time for conversation, questions. I would like to to know uh, your question. Okay, now uh, from the book "Rituals of the Pagan Beauty," it's a poetry book, kind of collage because it has uh, poems, uh, myth. Uh, Japanese koans. Um, it's a story of a woman whose name is Angelica, and she's a pagan beauty. I will read the prologue of this uh, book. Those who have lived in the vast prairie of song and silence, we have heard of a pagan beauty named Angelica. Half woman, half dream, there is no bar that doesn't resonate with her laughter, no heart that her words have not occupied, no eyes that have not been dazzled by her sweet copper skin, nor hands that wouldn't desire to read her naked body under the autumn moon like a psalm during Sunday mass. Like night and day, and day Angelica was of a beauty, a beauty that's, that wounds like happiness lost, because one would have to be numb to see her nude and not suffer the desire to make love to her. One have to be numb not to feel the spell of her beauty and lament during the following moons her absence and her wings. Angelica was lovely like the mauve twilight of New Orleans, bright like the summer skies of Colorado, calm like the warm stars of the Caribbean. She was but three times seven years old and her smile was of tiny pearly white teeth that disarmed the wildest of men. Her voice had not reached the stature of, of her ears and her golden locks twinkled in the dark fringes of the bar. For one must know that the pagan beauty was so sweet and so tough that nowhere in the vast prairie was there a man who could look her in the eyes without his eyes swelling up with a vague melancholy. 
This is the story of the pagan beauty. Who many va vow to love and drifting try to forget, dulling their senses over the warm wine of the long prairie night. And yeah, uh, old to wine, yeah, more wine and cats. You know. <laughs> I don't have a cat because uh, I live uh, by myself in Fort Collins and I travel a lot, so it's, it'll be difficult to look for somebody to take care of the cat. So. Um, this is part uh, of the um, book, uh, Ritual of the Pagan Beauty. Yeah, so the, the, the book is devoted to uh, wine, love, and poetry, the combination of the three, which is nothing new. I mean, since the Greek, we have the, those uh, three topics related. You know. Old to wine. Wine, perfume, ruby, springs from an amphora of time, ineffable, like the flaming chaos of my heart. Slow euphoria, oblivion, chained to the world, heavy as the pain, dark as the blood, complicit with the friends of the prairie night, ally of lovers, because that night, O oh, pagan beauty, will not silence your eyes, not your fingers full of poetry, Pablo Neruda sings the soft and ruly velvet, but I sing the sweet velvety wound of your sex in my lips. Summer's goblet was of crystal and the wine from Bordeaux that I serve to your lips. Like autumn's gold, warm like your breasts, generous like your hands, the wine I drank gently in the vintage of the silent pagan night. Topaz, fury and intelligent, the wine that I drank soberly in the flight of words looking for your image. There's no clearer truth than the sensual Merlot I drink before the verse. Where are now you who offer me the glass I continue to drink? Omar Kayang sings, and I sing, Who are, where are you now, O oh pagan beauty? In what amphora that doesn't belong to me? On whose lips thirstier than my own? In what wine dark as suffering? In what truth sharp and deaf like fire? Where may you be now that my heart couldn't follow like a sweet, warm, autumnal melody, full of wonder and time, and of a quiet euphoria of nards and kisses on the path to find you. Drunk from immortality, without past or future, I will drink this last glass, perfumed with saffron, cinnamon, and oblivion. And the wine will calm my suffering, and like ladanum, will drop light tears from my tired eyes. And I think the last one I could read is a short story. And uh, it's the story of uh, a guy whose name is uh, Carmino Flores, who wanted to be a poet. So he, he was trying to get a formula, to find a formula. Uh, to be uh, uh, the best poet. Let's see what happens with him. Uh, Carmino Flores dedicated the best years of his life to the quest of rivers, cats, wine, shadows, and a woman's indifference. He believed that these were the secrets of poetry. One morning, he realized with considerable discouragement that not important poet, with the exception of Jose Joaquin Perez, had been born on the banks of the Ozama River in Santo Domingo. So he, did, he decided to abandon his hometown. He lived intensively and deliriously in cities of, on the banks of wild rivers, the Hudson, the Seine, 
the Rhine, the Thames, the Euphrates, the Plata, the Ganges, the Yellow River, the Danube. And those rivers brought him the echoes of voices that had passed and stayed. He swore that one day he would write a poem that would be like rivers, like a river. They would flow and they and their flowing wouldn't exhaust their meaning or compromise their existence. In Manhattan, the waters of the Hudson brought him the clear and mighty echoes of Walt Whitman. In Seville, he found the sweet rhymes of Becker. In Berlin, the rhyme the Rhine resounded with the verses of Rilke. The Tigris and the Euphrates flow like wine that Omar Khayyam had uncorked. Borges never stopped listening to that river of liquid silver in which the fatherland was founded twice. And Baudelaire, like Paris, agonized on the banks of the Seine. In Baudelaire's poetry, Carmino Flores found the perfect conjunction of rivers, cats, and wine. For this reason, he decided to dedicate many long years to the translation of the cat. Baudelaire taught him to love cats and a woman with a cold and profound eyes. Lie down, my beautiful cat, on my amorous heart. Retract your claws, let me plunge in your beautiful eyes, mixed with metal and agate. His passion for cats and a woman with lion color skin took Carmino back to Santo Domingo, a strange conjunction or a banal destiny. I tell this woman's story in another place. Carmino Flores surrounded himself with alley cats, tabbies, angoras, hybrids, Persians. And during January's blood, uh, bloody sunsets, when the cold wind blows, he contemplated uncertain hours with a glass of wine in one hand, and he caressed the head of a small lion with the other. In other cities, on the banks of so many cities, Carmino Flores spent many nights, perhaps too many, drinking and trying to write. Tireless reader of Omar Khayyam that he was, he was more inspired by his verse to drink than he was to write. Ah, my beloved, fill the cup that clears today of past regrets and future fears. Tomorrow, why tomorrow, I may be myself with yesterday, uh, 7,000 years. He drank copiously and fluidly like river, like a river, ruby color covered in a Sauvignon, his bouquet was intense, delicate, fine, smooth, and mellow. Pinot Noir, with uh, his beloved delicacy, lightened his heart. Words uh, became magic and life an illusion. He drank torrents of Merlot from Bordeaux. It was violet, flower, dry, balanced, and harmonious. He wanted to achieve inner peace. Chardonnay with his hay-like yellow hue, consoled him for a while. Its intense bouquet was like uh, that, that of a ripe banana or a fresh melon. It was smooth, harmonious, frank, and intimate. It reminded him vaguely of a woman whom he had loved and with whom he had been unhappy in seven different cities. Wine filled him with shadows and sadness. He admired Homer's clear image, Democritus' precise words, and Borges' arcane realities. Each of them gave him the conviction that images are magical and that men only find themselves in definite acts. Then he took up his pain and hid from himself and his own shadows, in his own shadows. If something important or beautiful happened to Carmino Flores, before he died, it was the following. I've been nothing more than a puppet tangled up by streams of desire. He died blind, alcoholic, surrounded by mangy cats in a city on the bank of a river whose basin was full of dust, abandoned seven times by the same woman, 
and without having written anything worthwhile, because he never understood that poetry doesn't live in things. On the contrary, things live in poetry the way you live in a house, a city, a woman, or perhaps a river. Thank you. been struggling with uh, a literary genre for a long time because I don't, I don't think, I don't feel comfortable in any of them. You know, I'm trying to escape from one genre to another. That's, uh, sometimes I write what I call cuentema, uh, cuentema from cuento, short story, and emma from poema, poem, because it's a mixture of uh, prose and poetry, maybe poetic prose or maybe a, pro a poem in prose. So when I have an idea or an image, I just start taking notes, you know, in my notebook. And then uh, according, I'm rewriting re and rewriting, it, it's uh, the, the idea or the image is looking for its form. And it ended up in being a poem or a short story or cuentema, yeah, or prosema, poem in prose, yeah. Uh, but um, I started my, my, no, my last project I'm working on is a, is a poetry book. I started to, to work this book as a poetry book, uh, Rhapsody of the Visible and Invisible. So sometimes you know, I have a collection of poems from different uh, epochs, and I put them together to publish them. But sometimes I write a poetry book, like a project. <laughs> Thank you. Yes? Could you tell us a little bit about the influences on your work? I'm, I'm wondering, it's sort of a two-part question. Mm -hmm. uh, one, to what extent does your Dominican self become expressed in your, in your work, in your poetry? And then, speaking of wine, mm -hmm. which has notes of violet and melon and whatever, <laughs> I feel I, I'm sensing notes of um, Neruda, Apollinaire, all the, uh, mm -hmm. the poets that you mentioned. Could you talk about the influences? Yes. Like? When I was uh, studying literature in the Dominican Republic um, in uh, 1978, I was reading uh, the, the, the boom, the literary boom from Latin America, you know, Borges, Cortázar, García Márquez, et cetera, et cetera. But I loved, I loved, uh, Cortázar, Julio Cortázar, because, you know, Cortázar writes in poetic prose, even though he, he has some poems written, not so good, uh, but he has, uh, in, in, in his short stories, some of the short stories are poems, really. And in the novel, Rayuela, uh, uh, the, the, what he calls chapter, chapter number seven, is a small uh, paragraph, uh, is a poem. So I wanted to write like Cortázar. I wanted to be Cortázar in my first book, uh, short story book, Viajantes in Song, uh, Sleepless uh, Travelers. It's a Cortázarian uh, book. But then I found uh, other writers, like Vigilio Piñera from, Cu from Cuba, poet, uh, short story writer, and novelist. Um, Augusto Monterroso from Guatemala, and then living in uh, in Mexico for many years. And uh, of course, in poetry, the group of uh, avant garde, Neruda, Vallejo, Huidobro, impacted me a lot. And then I discovered the French uh, poetry, the symbolist, Baudelaire, 
uh, Berlin, Rambo, uh, and 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 I I was uh, studying French at that time, and I bought a couple of volumes in bilingual edition, and also comparing, reading, and what I liked the most was the music and the rhythm in the, in their poetry. No? Um, yes, about Dominicanness. Yes, of course. I since I live in I've been in the United States for more than twenty years now. Even I, I go back to the Dominican Republic uh, twice a year, and I went uh, last year. I spent a whole year for the sabbatical research there. Uh, I reside not in the Spanish language, not only in the Spanish language, as uh, the Polish uh, poet Milos said, but also in in the writing, and not only in the writing, but also in the images I have from my childhood and from my, my youth when I was uh, young in the Dominican Republic, uh, and maybe as a way to resist the assimilation to the American culture, maybe as a way to, to keep my language uh, because sometimes, some people can do it, but some others don't, like me. Uh, one of uh, Junot Diaz's characters said, you, you cannot reside in two houses or in two languages. Or sometimes I try to escape from one language to another, even though I don't write in English, but I do read in English and French and Portuguese, and I try to escape from the prison of um, the Spanish language going to another language and then assimilating, like, like cannibalizing those languages into my Spanish language. And uh, I'm writing more and more about childhood, maybe because I'm 57 now, so I'm going back to my childhood, a long-term memory, uh, because childhood is the true fatherland. Yes? <laughs> you know, Cortázar always said that you can only know one language perfectly at any given time, and that all the others go up and down, mm -hmm. you know, 98, 97. And he also said, because he lived abroad such a long time, oh, yeah. that he only wrote in Spanish, that he really preserved Spanish like a precious bag, that he had to borrow it all the time. Oh. Of course, he spoke French perfectly. Yeah, that's beautiful. Some English, and you know, he was married to Lithuanian, so uh -huh. he understood a number of languages. And I thought that was very interesting, that he, he said only one language that you really speak to diamond perfection, you know, to speak. Yeah, and he speaks with a French accent. I have heard some of uh, his uh, work narrated by himself, and he says, uh, he uh, speaks like with this R, the yeah. French R, but his written Spanish is perfect. Yeah. It's perfect. Well, you know, he was born in Belgium, and his yeah. he had a, a, a French nanny, but it was a really a defect. I don't think it was the that he couldn't pronounce the F. You know. <laughs> 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 yeah. And another case is uh, uh, Vicente Huidobro. Vicente Huidobro uh, started writing in French. <laughs> he wrote a, a poetry book, Horizon Cajé, Square Horizons, and then he translated into Spanish, <laughs> and he became one of the, one of the greatest uh, uh, Latin American uh, poets. And of course, Borges said that he uh, that he, his, his English, you know, he read Quixote in, in, in English and his Spanish was such a bad translation. Well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> he has a, a debutade and his jokes are a, a, a genre yes. for, for Borges, you know. Yes. <laughs> yes. yes? I have two questions. Uh -huh. The first one is about the, the cat that eats your memory. I beg your pardon? The, the first question is about the cat that eats your memory. Uh -huh. Yeah, maybe. You know, I try. <laughs> you know, I'm a critic uh, uh, as well. So as a critic, I try not to apply the criticism to my own fiction work because I, I'll be like uh, the judge and the accused uh, <laughs> one at the same time. But maybe, you know, well, in my childhood, that's part of my biography. You know, I have uh, uh, tabby cats, yellow tabby cats at home. And I was so, so attached 
to them. But you know, in maybe when I read Baudelaire, he has two points, uh, Bababa cards, uh, maybe it's a symbol of uh, freedom, uh, beauty, you know, that the cat is so independent, that's what, which I like a lot. Maybe identify with this uh, independence, be myself, and be uh, proud, you know, it's a symbol of pride also, cat, yeah. <laughs> I tried to laugh at myself before others laughed <laughs> at me. <laughs> uh, sort of, um, but at the same time, I use uh, some other characters, some other people. It's like um, uh, Roman Aklef, a key, a short story, like uh, trying to tell something to certain people. <laughs> <laughs> with a hidden meaning, you know, <laughs> that you, ha you can read uh, between lines. <laughs> I don't want to say because this uh, conversation is going to be broadcasted, you know. I didn't think, you know, I didn't think on purpose uh, about that, you know. Maybe, maybe I did it unconsciously, you know. Yeah, but I play with you know, certain symbols and images that are repeated. Well, in fact, Borges says that uh, a writer writes the same poem or the same short story during his whole life <laughs> because of the, 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 yeah, the repetition. And sometimes in different levels, like a spiral. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah Borges used to love to come to the Library of Congress, and he was here for really? the last time in '84. And he used to, you know, he couldn't see. So he said, "Please take me to the stacks. I want to smell the book." <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's that's very nice. Yeah, you know? <laughs> so lovely to see him touching the volume. You know, mm -hmm. by that time he couldn't see at all. <laughs> Now that you said yes, uh, I didn't think it, uh, you know, on purpose of that. But you know, I have read and used bad, bad thing uh, in criticism. Yeah, but you're right. Thank you. Yes. Could you talk for a moment about the experience of teaching and maybe how you go about teaching something as personal as poetry? Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, I teach. Um, courses on music, uh, cinema, and literature. Um, and I don't, when I teach poetry, for example, or, or fiction, I don't teach my own work, because again, I want to, to keep separated my own fiction and my, my teaching I, and the criticism. But, uh, but my own writing informed me about my criticism and my teaching. And my fiction is informed by the criticism unconsciously. No? I think that it's an advantage for me to, to be a critic and a writer because I, could, I can understand 
better, more and better, the process of creation. And then you know, sometimes uh, the students ask me, how, how do you know this? How? Uh, because I'm a writer, you know. Uh, I'm so I, I have a, a better understanding of the process of writing. In Spanish only, and yeah. Then yes. 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 I. Yes, I have a friend, uh, a Cuban American, Mateo Pardo. Uh, he has translated uh, most of my poems. After he translated uh, my work, I get together with him, and then uh, we discuss. You know, we uh, uh, negotiate. <laughs> the meaning. <laughs> yes, I, I I have a project to maybe to publish a bilingual bilingual poetry uh, book because you know I've been here so long in the United States and some readers are only English uh, readers, so I like to reach out to the English readers. Mm -hmm. In Spanish, okay. Oh, okay. Let me see which one. <laughs> okay, maybe about the the pagan beauty. I have another project, uh, which is a. Uh, Ekphrastic poem or uh, poems on painting that I was uh, working. I couldn't publish the book because uh, I have no permission for the painting, and the poems have to be accompanied by the paint. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and then uh, I have uh, painters like uh, Edward Edward Hopper, Magritte, Picasso. Uh, Remedios Baro, which I like the most, uh, and then I wrote poem on a specific, a specific painting. For example, this one I read it first in Spanish and then in English. Uh, it is called Early Sunday Morning, Edward Hopper. Domingo en la mañana. No sé por qué se torna tan desolada la mañana del domingo. En el cuadro de Edward Hopper, será la tristeza del verde de la luz tamizada que avanza sobre las sombras un domingo temprano en la mañana. Hay un viejo edificio de dos plantas, la barbería está cerrada, el poste de rayas rojas y azules apagado. Hay una tienda de filatelia que nadie visita. La oficina de correos no abre, por supuesto, los domingos. En la calzada, un hidrante aburrido y gris nos recuerda el último crepúsculo. ¿Dónde estará la muchacha con su sombrero de Pamela que no ha asistido a misa? ¿Dónde se habrá escondido la risa de los niños que deberían estar jugando en las calles? ¿Dónde estará el anciano vestido de blanco coleccionista de sellos? ¿Dónde estarán la loca del pueblo y su cabellera de fuego, el barbero italiano y sus áreas operáticas, la rubia trasnochada en el bar de mala muerte, el panadero y su ayudante de dientes carcomidos por el alcohol? En fin, el ministro blanco de la Iglesia Bautista Blanca, el ministro negro de la Iglesia Bautista Negra. Una catástrofe de hastío, acaso, o una epidemia de soledad, habrá exterminado a todos los habitantes del pueblo como una bomba de neutrones y ha dejado intacto el edificio en el cuadro de Hopper, temprano, la mañana de un domingo. Early Sunday morning, Edward Hopper. I do not know why Sunday, the morning in Edward Hopper's painting, is turning out to be so desolate. Can it, can it be the sadness of green, or perchance the filter light that advances across the shadows of an early Sunday morning? Here's an old two-story building. The barber shop is closed. The light of his red-blue striped pole switched off. Here's a stamp collection store that nobody visits. The post office, of course, is closed on Sundays. 
On the sidewalk, a hydrant, gray and bored, doesn't remember the last sunset. Where might be the girl with her broad brim straw hat who will miss Sunday mass? Where might hide the laughter of children who, shouldn't, who should be playing in the streets? Where might we find the old man, the stamp collector, dressed in white? Where might be the town's crazy lady and her flaming red hair? The Italian barber and his opera, the red head up uh, all, all night in a seedy bar, the baker and his helper with teeth stained by tobacco and alcohol, and finally, the white minister of the white Baptist church, the black minister of the black ba Baptist church. A catastrophe of tedium, perhaps, or an ep epidemic of loneliness might have exterminated all the town's inhabitants fr as from a neutron bomb and left intact this building in Hopper's painting early on a Sunday morning. Uh, I was, uh, I used to live in Meadville, Pennsylvania, small town, 15,000 inhabitants. And this uh, painting by Hopper reminds me the, the small town of uh, Meadville. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.